All right, guys. Uh, good to be with you all in another edition of RCC Today. We use this platform for those of you, maybe your first time checking us out, to explore a lot of different issues, topics uh, that uh, the church is facing today. Uh, and we especially want to engage on this topic, uh, a really important mm-hmm. one. Uh, it's been around, uh, well, in some ways, it's, it's been here for a number of years, but it feels like it's especially, it's, it's own, the, the profile of it is growing even more. Uh, topic is Christian nationalism, and uh, Christian nationalism. a lot of different uh, definitions and other things floating around uh, about what that is, what that means. But uh, one of the first people we thought of, the guy we thought of, the guy, the guy, right the now, one and only, <laughs> to uh, to help us think through this issue is uh, Caleb Campbell. Caleb, welcome. Thank you. Caleb is the pastor of Desert Springs Bible Church yep. up in North Phoenix. Yep. Uh, I just say North Phoenix was, I'm in downtown. It's all North Phoenix to me. <laughs> <laughs> These are the facts. Um, and Caleb has been uh, sort of really, I think, led of the war to kind of really think through how to think you through this issue of Christian nationalism, but particularly how we reach people who have been influenced by Christian nationalism. So Caleb, welcome. Good to have yep. you, Brandon. Thank you, guys. Uh, and so let's sort of get into it. Uh, You've uh, and you oh, I should mention too, and we'll mention it again. Uh, Caleb has started something called uh, Disarming Leviathan. Yep, is a divi- disarmingleviathan.com. That's right, disarmingleviathan.com. So, uh, if you b- are interested in uh, what we're talking about and the things uh, and want to be more equipped towards this and support uh, those who want to to be better engaged in how to, to reach people who are being influenced by this, check that website out. Uh, but, uh with that, with that too, he's also got like these little stickers. Got some swag. Yeah, I got some swag. <laughs> some I mean, swag so, too. I mean, yeah. it, you're not real if you ain't. Like, you know, I'm just saying. No doubt. No doubt. Um, Caleb, why don't you tell us a little bit about just what led you to even become interested in this topic? It was this isn't something sort of just out there. You're kind of reading newspaper and like, oh yeah, I want to do this. This hit like right in your own church. Yeah, yeah. So I've been pastoring at Desert Springs since 2006. We're in the North Phoenix suburbs and. I stepped into the lead pastor role in 2015 and thought I knew what I was getting into. And in 2016, uh, it was kind of the rise of that, right in that era was the rise of uh, MAGA world and the you know, mm. Trump election and campaign. And uh, what that did was it, it started to reveal some of the fractures that were in the church and in, in the congregation I serve. So 2016, 2017, 2018, you know, I'm navigating that and I'm getting resistance on things that we didn't used to get resistance for. So for instance, we would do a sermon on uh, caring for immigrants or a sermon on caring for refugees, which we had done before, but in this particular season, Hmm. it was met with more resistance. And I was trying to figure out what is going on that I'm getting resistance. Uh, Part of my story uh, is uh, race. I used to be a neo-Nazi skinhead. So part of my testimony is uh, racism and racial reconciliation. Mm. And I ta- talked about that all the time. And it was part of sermons that I did all the time. And then you, know, you get into 2018, 2019, 2020, I did the exact same sermon mm. that I had mm. done years prior. And I'd get put really, really aggressive pushback mm. and yeah. accusations that I hadn't heard before. And again, There's I've been at, much different. About y- what you've been saying. Yeah. I, mean, I, I felt like I was staying the course, you know, um, mm just leading out of my convictions, the convictions we had as a church and, and my predecessors convictions as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, It wasn't like we came in and like dramatically changed our perspective on these things. But what was changing was the, the, within the broader culture of North Phoenix, uh, what was generally relegated to quiet, hushed kitchen table conversations, discontent that was expressed there. Now, uh, because of the MAGA world phenomenon, uh, there was permission given to now express discontent with these issues in your community group, to the person next to you in the pew, on social media. And so it didn't, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've come to believe is that 2020, as kind of a flashpoint, did not create these fractures. It simply unveiled them. So in that sense, mm. 2020 was an apocalypse. Apocalypse meaning an unveiling. It unveiled the fractures that were underneath. And I just, as a pastor, I did not see the depth of these fractures. Uh, mm. And it was that season that it was revealed to me. Um, by the time we get into 2020, uh, again, we're staying the course, getting a lot more resistance, um, just, again, leading into issues around how we uh, live and serve as a church around the conversation about going to online services and, and eventually face masks and things like that. 
how we responded to uh, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, mm. uh, then the election that was, I mean, these things are one right after the other. So we had a mass um, group of folks uh, decide <coughs> to uh, choose to attend other churches, many of them choosing. I mean, a uh, lot of people. Uh, You're talking like. So from 20, th- this congregation that was there in 2016, 80% of them are no longer there. Mm. Most oh, wow. of them have chosen to participate wow. in other churches. Some have moved, and, and and some have chosen not to participate in church, period. Uh, but the majority mm. ended up uh, what I call redeploying to another mm. local church, many of them choosing local <laughs> churches I like that, that uh, eventually would come to now embrace uh, American Christian nationalism. Mm. And I, hadn't, I don't think I'd ever really thought about that term. Started hearing it in 2001, or excuse me, 2021, and started getting invitations to attend uh, some of these rallies. But they, the people who were inviting me, they weren't calling them rallies. They were calling them revivals. And that religious <laughs> overtone really got me interested. So I started attending uh, in 2021. Uh, down the street for me, um, every month there's a, a what's called Turning Point, Turning Point USA. Charlie Kirk is the leader. And they created a, um, they, 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 their operation has been based here for a couple years. Charlie used to be uh, with uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. at Liberty with the Falkirk Center. Mm. Uh, that kind of fell apart, moved the operation out here. Um, when Trump was hosted by Dream City Church, I think it was June of 2020. Uh, if you guys remember, this is like when Ducey had this stay at home to slow the yeah. spread. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So like nobody's that. doing mass gatherings and Dream City to host, they hosted Trump, but they said that they had uh, air filters that would filter out 99.9% of COVID. I remember so that. I remember that made yep. headlines, and uh, yeah. I thought, man, I'd sure like to get some of those air filters, but they weren't <laughs> weren't for sale, so we didn't get any. And uh, so they start they start this uh, kind of this movement where they're hosting these rallies eventually once a month. Uh, so by the summer of 2021, I I started attending some of them and was really disturbed about what I saw. Mm. So that, that kind of got me into it and I started learning as much as I could about it. Um, what would your be, be your working definition of Christian nationalism? And then it kind of, from there, I'd kind of yeah. like to hear, uh, and what was your experience at being in yeah. some of these uh, Christian nationalist spaces? Yeah, that was a question that popped in my mind. I was like, what did, yeah, what were you hearing? But yeah, like yeah. the definition first, for sure. Yeah, so the, the, the problem with the term is, is it's somewhat ambiguous right now. Yeah. Um, there, I've dis- I've I've kind of discerned about nine different working definitions of Christian nationalism. I usually call it American Christian nationalism because there are a, v- a variety of types. So Christian nationalism could mean anything. So a person who identifies as a Christian nationalist could mean anything from uh, I I'm a Christian and I want my whole nation to be Christians. Okay, so something innocuous like that, like, and I'm like, cool, like that's. If that's what we're talking about, I got no problem. Like, yeah. I think everyone would sure. be benefited by following Jesus. <laughs> All the way on the other sp- side of the spectrum, you have, uh, I believe that the government of these here United States should fund, officially recognize, and enforce Christianity. Hmm. So you have kind of this, almost this Christendom concept. Like of, empire. Uh, like yeah, so. like a Christian empire yeah. almost. And then anywhere in between. Um, so you have like some, uh, especially in, uh, I think many would be familiar, especially with the Queen's recent death uh, in the United Kingdom. Well, they're a Christian nation. They have an official state church. Uh, the state church is funded by government dollars. And the Queen, uh, up until her death, was the kind of the protector and <coughs> defender of the church. And so you have nation states like that throughout Europe and around the world that are kind of in that middle space. Um, Most of the folks I'm running into are uh, what I would say right of that, uh, Mm -hmm. more towards the officially recognize and enforce some version of uh, Christianity. Interesting. Yeah. What uh, my question for for people who advocate for that is always: which parts of Christianity? Mm-hmm. Like, are we talking about love, right. joy, peace, patience, kindness, <laughs> goodness, faithfulness, and self control? And how do we have the federal government enforce those? Gentleness. Things? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> like, I'd, I'd be really curious to hear about how 
the Sermon on the Mount impacts our Department of Defense budget. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like, like if we yeah. get Mennonites in the federal government to be our Christian nation, <laughs> I, I'm interested. Well, you're in sort that. of. I mean, you're, you're. I think you're steering <laughs> us in the. You know, maybe a, a sub point to that definition is, um, it's some form of Christian government, but in, in, in point of fact, it's sort of a particular. Uh, expression yes. of uh, Christian government that seems to map very well with where the current Republican Party is at, right? Yes, as it Please turns just. out, uh, we're not um, talking about predominantly um, uh, Orthodox expression, Eastern Orthodox expressions. Yeah. We're not talking about Anabaptist expressions. We're not talking yeah. about AME expressions. We're mm. usually specifically inferring mm. uh, uh, suburban Protestant. Yeah. Mm. Presbyterian, uh, Congregationalist, Baptist, somewhere in that space. Well, but that's the thing, though. It's it's there. What's sort of being mapped as here's the best expression of a Christian government mm-hmm. is things like, uh, um, you know, the ability to have have as many guns as I want, for yes. example, or really tight borders yes. and no amnesty for uh, those who came here uh, without papers. Right. Uh, you know, really uh, sort of isolationist tra- trade policies. Uh, ability to drill oil wherever we want. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are all political points, and we can sort of talk about the pros and cons of each of those points. Yep. What's interesting to me is those are increasingly being mapped as well. That's what Christians right. should believe. Yep. Right. Yeah. The the uh, practice of proof texting, taking yeah. a text out of its context and slapping it onto my idea or what I'm trying to advocate hmm. for, is rampant uh, in most of American politics, but explicitly in these groups that advocate for Christian nationalism. I mean, I've heard people say things like, um, you know, uh, Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as ourself. And that's why we have to protect our God given right to gun ownership, because you can't love your neighbor if they're under attack. If you don't have a gun. <laughs> wow. This, this was happening at these revivals or excuse yeah, me, yeah, rallies. Yeah. Amen. Revivals, yeah. revivals, yeah. So, <laughs> so the idea, that's taking, what they were saying. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, some, wow. some interesting exegesis there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know Jeremiah twenty nine says demand. They'll say demand the prosperity of the city, and that's why we have to. Um, that's why we have to propagate free market capitalism. Man, there's some her- hermeneutical, hermeneutical gymnastics that's going on yeah. up in these these little revivals that you're. Oh yeah, you're yeah. going I, to. I, I, no, it's more little. like it's more like that's hermeneutical crazy. magic tricks. And if you know anything about magic, it's really sleight of hand, and it's mm. not really magic. It's mm. hey, let me get your attention over here while I'm doing something that illusion. you don't see. Like illusion. Like, yeah. No, it's misdirection. 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 Yeah. That's okay. the thing. In like, there's a little bit of truth, but then you know you sort of. Yeah, you you understand where to like send people's attention so that you have something else that you really are controlling. It's not really about the truth at all. It literally is misdirection. So it's like now you see me, now you don't. You know, it's, it's it, that's what it sounds like when it comes to the hermeneutic. It's hermeneutical not, magic. Yeah, that's a good book title. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Let's talk about that. <laughs> Let's speak on it. I like so that. I mean, you're obviously alluding to things that you were you actually saw happen. Yeah. So yeah, you've, I mean, you don't have to share all your stories, but like what, what, one of the things that's good for those who are watching to know, you actually, you went to these, um, yeah. to the rallies, mm-hmm. uh, and, but then you went deeper. You went to these sort of private sessions mm-hmm. where they invited pastors and ministry leaders to hear directly from like from Kirk and others, right, mm-hmm. who are going to equip them and try to lead their churches. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like you, you went and like all yeah. the way in. Did some s- Zoom call trainings. Yeah. yeah. So just to sort of get the full gamut of what it is yeah. uh, that was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I just, that seems like a s- surreal experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are, but I mean, but it's, it's you know, it's inter- I mean, it's been great listening to you talk about it, but you also, I think you began to feel some sympathy for people who mm-hmm. are sort of deeply steeped in this. Anyway, I'm going, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. What are some What are some of the main things that are happening? I mean, maybe even one or two, like personal, like direct stories of what you experienced or heard. Yeah, I can tell you. The first time I went, uh, again, I, what struck me was that people were using the language of revival, and yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I've been to dozens of political events at churches, mm-hmm. and usually what will happen is uh, the pastor or a representative from the church will say, hey, we're here, we love our community, we're doing this as a service to the community, thanks for gathering here. Uh, we'd like to bring candidate Jones up and candidate Jones is going to talk about their, you know, blah, blah, blah. And and if you don't mind, we'd like to pray something like that, but Mm -hmm. they're always doing work to signify like this ain't church. Mm -hmm. What we're doing right now is a civic, 
uh, a gift to our to uh, uh, to our community, right? It's a it's a civic role we're playing as a church. So I, I'm kind of expecting that. So I roll up, and there's a few thousand people in this you know mega church setting at Dream City. And they do three worship songs that I'm very familiar with because we do them at our church. Mm. And the worship mm. leader's up there saying, get on your feet, we're going to worship Jesus today. And, and uh, mm. the third song, if I remember right, was Jesus at the Center of It All, during which Charlie came out, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, there was a, um, a time of prayer to receive Christ. So if you want to receive Jesus, every head bowed, every eye closed, just slip up that hand, that type of thing. Wow. There was an offering taken for a ministry he, that they had done wow. in North Arizona. Yeah. Wow. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. So, uh, so for me, you know, as a evangelical pastor, I'm like, dude, I know what this is. This is church. We're doing church right now. Mm. Uh, it, it, the template was exactly the same as, you know, or similar to our, the template we do. So I was very familiar, but I was struck when uh, Charlie was introduced and then brought out. What didn't happen is he didn't say, hey, everyone, thanks so much for letting me be here today. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about conservative politics and my ideas on how we should run the government. He comes out and says, the word of God says. Mm. Oh. So he's preaching. Which, he's preaching, right? He's taken on the posture of a preacher. And then he starts, frankly, misquoting and misapplying scripture in such frequency that I'm, I'm thinking to myself, how can anyone, how's anyone buying this? Like, this is such a blatant disconnect from the text. And what <laughs> struck me, what was striking to me is I'm watching this room full of people, amen and hallelujah. Like, their hands are raised, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Mm. And it, that drew me in. Uh, I became exponentially more curious because I, I realized, oh, we're not here having a political conversation. Mm. We're having a religious experience. Wow. Mm. There's, there's, a, there's an allegiance mm. conversation that's going on here. There's a power dynamic, a spiritual power dynamic. Mm. And so that's what drew me in to want to know more. I wanted to know more about why, uh, why Jesus followers or people who've been part of a church for a long time, why they're drawn to this. And so that kind of set me out on this path of uh, trying to figure it out. I, I wanted to, for lack of a better term, I wanted to deconstruct it, at least on paper, and try to figure out what, what was going on in people's lives, what was being told to them. And then the, the follow-up question to that was, well, then how can I reach them with the good news of the kingdom of God? So what is drawing them? Like, what, what is it that is, um, that, that is being tapped into that's yeah. drawing people into this, this kind of, this, what we're calling Christian nationalism? I'm not a, uh, I'm a pastor, so I'm not a sociologist or psychologist, so we're, I'm going to rely yeah. on folks like that to help like, figure out all the technical terms, but here's what I experienced when I would talk to people and when I would listen to the rhetoric, mm -hmm. is there is a continual stirring up of anxiety and rage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the anxiety is around what I would call ethnic erasure. So it's this mm. fear that my way of being is under threat. Not just that we're going to lose some money with more taxes or it's going to be more cumbersome to get documentation at the DMV. The threat is our way, if those people, the enemy, get in political power, right, the woke mob, if they take over, our way of being will cease to exist. So ethnic erasure. Mm. And so the, the eth if I could nerd out Bible style. Well, uh, ethnic erasure and like, Personally, like our ethnicity will the go people to, in will the room extinct. are being told. Yeah. So our way, we're an endangered species. Yeah, endangered, we're becoming yeah. an endangered species. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the unfortunate thing is, uh, there's not really a great word to describe that ethnos. Mm -hmm. So biblically, the the language of ethnos, mm -hmm. the Greek word talks about an identifiable people group. Sometimes it gets translated as nations or peoples, but it's people groups. Mm -hmm. So here's this identifiable people group, and we don't really have a name for it. They would call themselves American, but they would distinguish themselves from the coastal elites, like people who live in Seattle and San mm. Francisco and New York City. And, and so we, we just, as Americans, we just don't really have good language for it. I have found probably the most helpful so far term to use is it's Eisenhower's America. So the way of envisioning our oh. way of being as kind of that 1950s, Dwight D. Eisenhower era, yeah. that, that that kind of encapsulates it. A mm. modern 
expression of this. And I don't at all mean this term derisively. I've been accused of being patronizing. I don't at all mean it to be patronizing, but it's Cracker Barrel America. Mm-hmm. I, and I like Cracker Barrel. Like, but Cracker <laughs> Barrel has captured the sense, the, the, the flavor, the, the, the root of this ethnic identity and expression. Mm-hmm. And there's so much good there, right? There's so many things to... Uh, to celebrate and to elevate and to encourage. And, and there's a, just like every ethnos and what groups like turning point or, or flashpoint or others are doing is they're saying that whole way of being is directly under threat by the enemy. And so we have to rally together. And so what they're promising, they're stirring up fear and anxiety and rage. And then they're promising safety, belonging, and purpose safety. We're going to protect each other. You'll hear it. You'll literally hear that language. Right? Which is why we need so many guns. Mm. And we need people in power. So safety. We are going to protect one another. Mm. Belonging. True patriots like you and me. We're going to stand together. Purpose. Let's go out there and we're going to take over the school board. We're going to take over the county seat. We're going to get this candidate elected. Safety. Belonging. Purpose. And so it's coming from a place of fear and anxiety. Mm. It shifts to rage. And then they're promised as a balm to that anxiety, safety, belonging, and purpose. Interesting. So if you just listen to any talk track, just listen for the fear. There's some thread of fear and anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, here in Phoenix, if you drove up any major street, 80% of the signs, the political advertisements in my community were fear-mongering. Mm. This candidate is mm-hmm. an evil right. antichrist person yeah, who's going right. to like eat your children. I've seen that. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so what do we do when we're afraid? And, and this is the center of my argument. For, for a Jesus follower, we're always faced with this choice when we're afraid. When we're afraid of losing something that's near to us, we're always faced with the choice of, do I take the cross or the sword? Mm. So it's good. coyly, mm. I would say, Christian nationalism started in the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers come to take Jesus. I was and just Peter, Peter reaches for the sword. Yep. And Jesus says, put the sword away. We don't do that here. All right. The, the conflict that Jesus had with his disciples most frequently was a conver- was the conflict around power. Mm-hmm. Do we take the cross or do we take the sword? And what Christian American Christian nationalism argues is, is we are under threat and the cross isn't going to get us where we want to go. Wow. So we're going to take the cross. We're going to draw it on this sword here in order to justify its power and its use. Mm. So uh, man, that's, the way that you broke that down is, is, is excellent. I love it. But with that, though, what is some of the pushback that you get regarding that? It's a great question. Uh, it's not realistic. Well, like we live in a real world. And so that idea of putting down the sword, it's not realistic. Got you. Uh, can I ask one question? To, I know we got to wrap up. So I'm hoping this helps do that. Well, <laughs> I'm hoping. I won't after that, but go ahead. <laughs> it looks like classic misdirection and manipulation. And so I know in the beginning of this conversation, we were talking about the heart that we had to reach this Mm -hmm. group of people. Mm -hmm. And so my question then becomes when you look at that, I referred to it as magic and magic, not in the sense of like the fantasy, but like if you talk to a real magician, he'll tell you it's really, it's just misdirection. Mm -hmm. You know how to keep people's attention and where to direct it. And it sounds like that's what's happening and not just that, but then they're being manipulated And so you find these people under this sort of guise, this trance almost. Mm -hmm. So then you go, well, what then do Christians do to help unravel that, to wake them up, to get it where like Jesus, we, we take the cross, not the sword. Like, where do you, where do we go from here? I guess the question I'm asking. Excellent question. I can sort of tag onto that. Um, Yeah. What do we do? And then even before that, like, how do you, how do you make yourself want to do it? I mean, <laughs> um, and I think that's, that's a completely fair question. Caleb, yeah. Is that like you, you, I mean, I think people should know this because you've gotten a lot of hate mail mm-hmm. among other things. Mm. Like you would jump, you love people, right? And mm-hmm. this is out of, of a deep love for people. And I think it, it's actually been really helpful for me to sort of see them as, as lost. Not just mm. like those are the enemy. And that's, I think I'm like, what, well, this is craziness. What's going on here? Yeah. But you see them as lost. I'm sort of curious how you've developed a, such a heart for them, a love for them. And then what do you do to reach them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, they're me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's my community, it's yeah. my family, it's my people mm-hmm. to start with, mm. and I have been drawn in to rage-inducing, anxiety-ridden, fear-mongering before as well, and still mm. am tempted to do that. 
And so some of it is seeing myself in them, that, mm. that there is no temptation that they mm. are experiencing that I don't also experience. And so, you know, I, I think of the Apostle Paul when he talks about, you know, I'm the least. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who am I? I'm the worst of sinners. And my allegiances go to places where I think are more powerful than Jesus all the time. Mm. And so I think once I, once I kind of came to the understanding that like, this is the same thing that we're all facing. It's the, mm. it's just this particular sword ha- is red, white, and blue and sounds mm. like the, uh, the, the hymn amazing grace, right? <laughs> mm. um, th- this one's just more, got r- more religious overtones than others, but I'm tempted for the sword all the time too. And so I think recognizing myself, myself in them, just like any, any good missionary, right? If you don't love your mission field, you're not a missionary. You're a colonizer. Mm. You just want them to be like you. Mm. And I don't want to be, I don't, I don't need or mm. actually want people that I'm trying to minister to, to stop eating a Cracker Barrel and throw away their Lee Greenwood CDs. I want to, I want to <laughs> try to find within myself the peace and the strength of the Lord to celebrate the goodness of those things, even if there's a temptation within me to cast derision and shame upon it. Yeah. Uh, there's other cultures in the world that I think are you know, wrong or I'm disgusted by some of their practices. And so that's a me problem, not a them problem. Yeah. Mm. I think for, for reaching people, and I, I would encourage those of you listening who maybe have a family member or loved one uh, where the relationship is fractured. And, and what I've found in my own life, and I've had many relationships fractured over this, and so I feel that pain as well. I, I, I find that for many of us, we think that there's only three options. When, when that loved one or family member says that crazy thing, right? Mm. We're at the kid's birthday party. You guys know the scene, right? We're at the kid's birthday party. Aunt Betty's over in the corner, right? That 12-year-old's cutting her birthday cake and aunt betty says some crazy (laughs) hurtful Mm. awful thing and she (laughs) is full of conviction and (laughs) and vigor and you're just trying to have a good time with the kids and so what do you do and so for many of us we think well option number one is just ignore it just ignore the crazy okay well that's not gonna we're not gonna beget change by ignoring it two Mm -hmm. is disassociating aunt betty's not allowed to come to the birthday party anymore and I, and I want to honor boundaries, and there's certain times where we have to have boundaries for family members and friends where mm-hmm. maybe it's not yeah, wise and loving for them to come yeah. back. Like, I'm with you, right? However, if that's not the case, um, for some, we think the third option is uh, argue with Aunt Betty, right? Argue with our loved one. And, and what we're doing is we're having a head-to-head conversation. What Aunt Betty has said is a fact or opinion. Mm-hmm. And I can argue facts and opinions all day, but I I need to recognize that those facts and opinions in her being, they have to be true because of something going on in the heart. And that's actually where Jesus engaged with people. Wasn't in the facts and opinions, but it was in the heart. And so option four, which is the option I'm advocating for, is to, to the best of my ability by the power of the spirit, lead the conversation to the heart. So, for instance, Aunt Betty says something like, um, I just read that George Soros is funding 25,000 immigrants to come and eat our children Mm. and take all of our jobs. That's horrifying. Okay, so I hear that, right? And I can ignore it. I can kick her out of the house. I can argue with her facts and opinions. But I think a better way is to say, Aunt Betty, that sounds really scary. Mm. Tell me why that matters to you. Well, I'm so afraid for our, my grandkids. Oh, I am too. I may not be afraid of that thing you said, but I'm also concerned for the well-being and safety of your grandkids. Let's talk more about that and try again, trying to steer the conversation right away from the fact and opinion towards the root of it. And then, if as a Jesus follower, what I what I want to try to do is is this, uh, and I hope it's not a trick. <laughs> okay. I want to say, you know, Aunt Betty, I'm also very concerned about safety for our grandkids and, and I have a lot of thoughts and opinions on immigration and immigration policy and a lot of it's over my head but you know I've really been thinking a lot about what Jesus says about caring for the outsider the immigrant the widow the poor the orphan and I'm just I feel this tension within me about how do we provide safety for our kids and follow the Jesus way mm. which sometimes feels unsafe tell me what you think And what I've done in that conversation is try to reintroduce her to Jesus 
to reintroduce Jesus to that topic and then pray and hope that by the power of the Spirit, there will be some, some repentance that happens in her heart where she turns from going the way of the sword and turns back to the way of the cross. Nice. Thank you, man. This is really good. Yeah. Kill Campbell, Disarming Leviathan. Uh, check it out. Uh, it'll be helpful. Appreciate what you're doing, brother. Thank you all for having me.